The real life relationships among many variables can be very complex. Take another look with me at OpenOffice. This time we'll look at the page style dialog in OpenOffice Writer. Every variable in this dialog interacts because all of them work together to lay out the page. Start with the page size and the page margins. Of course, these constrain each other. The margins can't eat up more than all of the space on the page. The next tab on the page style dialog is page color. I'm not sure how this interacts with the other variables, so let's skip it. You can place a background graphic on every page and specify its size and position. Of course, the page size will constrain the graphic size and maybe its position. Should the margins constrain its position too? You can put a header at the top of the document and you can put a footer at the bottom. Hey, look at all these spacing commands. How do these interact with page size and margins? Does the location and size of the footer constrain the location and size of the header? If not, can you set it up so they overlap? Should that be possible? You can organize text on a page into columns. Ooh, there are parameters with every column. So with more columns, we get more variables. Try sticking that in an all pairs table. What's the minimum column width? What's the relationship between the columns and the page margins? Can a column extend down into the footer area? How does column width interact with text size? Here's our last panel. You can put a footnote on the pages. Well, how does this interact with the footer, the columns, the margins, the background graphics, and so on? I want you to think about organizing this into an all pairs test. I don't actually know how to count how many variables there are here because the numbers vary. For example, each column brings its own variables and all the variables all constrain each other. This complexity isn't unique to the page style dialog. I saw the same problems when I worked on human resources and employee tax software. I saw the same problems when I tested database management systems. I saw the same problems when I designed user interfaces for telephone systems. I saw the same problems when I worked with statistical packages. And as an experienced end user, I'm pretty sure that I'd see the same problems if I tried to test legal research software or concept mapping software or plagiarism detection software. In the applications where I was most conscious of the need for multivariable testing, all pairs didn't help me one bit with the combinations where I needed some help. And this is not new news. IBM supported the development of cause-effect graphing 30 years ago because that technique is designed to handle complex combinations of variables that do interact. I'm not an expert with cause-effect graphing. I took a five-day course in it. It was well taught by Richard Bender. And graduate students of mine have struggled through some of the original research reports and cause-effect product documentation. To us, this technique seemed hard to learn and hard to do. But of course, cause-effect graphing is designed to tackle some pretty tough test design problems. So maybe a lot of this difficulty is inherent in the complexity of the problems it's trying to help you solve. I do something a lot simpler than cause-effect graphing. It's nowhere near as thorough, but I found it useful. I start with a variable relationships tour, and then I pick a variable. I look for ways that the program uses it or can change it. And I ask what other variables are involved with that. I find it useful to capture this information in a table. So let's consider a hypothetical example. We've got a variable one and a variable two. And suppose the program operates on these together. In particular, suppose that the program forces variable one to always be less than variable two. To work with this in a table, start with the first variable, variable one. The columns of the table start with the ways that you can enter values into variable one. For example, you can probably type data into the variable, but maybe you can type data at first and then edit it later. Maybe you can read the variable's value from a file. Can the program overwrite the value with a calculated result? List each way that this variable's values can be set. The next two columns ask where you can display, print, transfer, or store the variable. Again, list them all. Now consider relationships. What variables are related to variable one? Of course, we know about variable two, so list it. Are there any others? If so, list them too. The final column captures the nature of the relationship. In our case, variable one has to be less than variable two. That's an example of a constraint. Variables can be related in many ways. For example, one variable can be a function of another, like variable one is three times variable two. Or variable one could be a function of several variables together, including variable two. Where variable one can be constrained by variable two, like variable one is less than variable two, which is the example we're in the middle of. There are several types of constraints. Now that you know the relationship, try to break it. For example, try entering 100 into variable one and 20 into variable two. The program is going to reject this because variable one would be greater than variable two, and that's not allowed. Next, try 10 in variable one and 20 in variable two. The program should accept this. 
But after it accepts it, try editing variable one. Will the program now let you put 100 into variable one? If you can, that's a simple bug. Maybe the programmers will consider it important, maybe not. Maybe they'll just tell you, don't do that. But now that you've broken the constraint, that's where the fun starts. The program shouldn't have accepted these values. It's now in a state that it should never have reached. So its behavior from here is unpredictable. Now try to display, print, and save the variables, especially where the program displays or prints them together. Program might fail when it attempts this, or it might display values that are just obviously unreasonable. These failures can be much more significant to the stakeholders than a simple input constraint violation. And then there are the other conceptual alternatives. You've seen this slide before. I think of combination testing in terms of three fundamentally different types. All pairs is a mechanical combination technique. Bach and Schrader used a random number generator to create sets of combination tests. That's a mechanical technique too. In both cases, you use human judgment to choose some variables and to choose values of interest for each variable. But then you use an algorithm to create a test. The test includes a specific value for each variable. Now a human could follow the algorithm or a computer could. The process of creating the test, though, is determined by the algorithm, not by the judgment of a person. That's why I call approaches like these mechanical. A few slides ago, I described configuration testing as it was done for some projects at Microsoft. They chose a lot of devices, and they made sure their tests achieved all singles coverage for those devices. But in addition to the mechanical combinations that achieved all singles, they created combinations for specific configurations that their tech support identified as troublesome or that their marketing staff identified as importantly popular. They tested those combinations too. That additional testing illustrates risk-based combination. It requires human judgment and is based on a theory of error or of potential cost of failure. And finally, there's scenario testing. All of scenario testing is combination testing. None of it is mechanical, and it may or may not be risk-focused. Testers design scenarios to explore meaningful combinations of variables, combinations that are going to be important to someone. This approach doesn't get you to the level of coverage that mechanical testing does, or to the power per test that risk-based combination testing does. But it does get you to bugs that people care about and fix. That's kind of useful, too. And the mechanical and risk-based testing approaches don't necessarily get you to that result. Time to sum up. Simple mechanical combination testing, like all pairs testing, is very useful in its place. And there are even simpler mechanical approaches, like Bach and Schrader's random combination. This achieved about the same coverage as all pairs, with only a few more tests. And there are also more flexible, but a little more difficult approaches, like cause-effect graphing. But mechanical combination is not all there is to combination testing and no one should want it to be. The non-mechanical approaches, risk-based or scenario-based, rely on judgment instead of algorithms. They don't automate well, and in some ways they're less efficient than the mechanical approaches. But they will find bugs, and they'll help you improve your understanding of the program and its potential weaknesses in ways that no mechanical approach can touch. And that's how it is with all the techniques we've studied. Every one of them is good for some purposes and less good for others. Strong in some ways, and weaker in others. Don't get trapped into relying on one or two techniques for most of your testing. Develop your skills so you can use several techniques well. With a diverse set of skills, you're in a position to make informed decisions about your testing strategy, about what assortment of techniques used collectively would work best for this project, in this context, with these information objectives. And really, that's the goal of test design. Well, that's it. See you in the next course.